All right, we're live. Hey there, everyone. We're back. This is, the first, this is the first YouTube live that I'm gonna do, or that I've ever done, and I don't even know if, I'm just new at it, so I'll, I'm gonna do the best that, that I can. Uh, welcome, and I'm gonna wait maybe a second here for a few other people to join, but we are answering questions today about the COVID economy. There, Of course, we are all, and by the way, this is kind of my makeshift office studio. I've got a tripod that I'm actually not using. I just have my phone up against the, uh, I've got my phone up against the window here, which seems to work better than one of these fancy tripods. I've got dogs in the back barking like everyone else. I've got four kids at the house running around trying to do some schoolwork. I, if you've got kids, I'd love to see comments about that or if, if people are actually getting any work done. My kids seem to be doing a little bit of work. I've got two of my four kids are doing work. One's too young to really go to school and the other one who my, who's my just turned 13 year old is, I, I don't know if he's really doing any work or he's fighting doing work this entire time. So uh, I, I, let me just see if I can figure out comments here. Let me take a look at this. Looks like, I don't know, no. if somebody do a heart or a comment and let me just see if I can see that. And then I'll get started with the Q&A here because I've got uh, a, a several questions that I've gotten over the last couple of weeks, really this last week, so the last couple of days, and I can start with that and answer those questions right here. So let's just go ahead and do that. Again, if anybody can do a heart or a like just so I can see testing. There we go. Thank you, Robert. Andy, thank you so much. Elizabeth, so it looks like I'm getting some comments there and we can do that as well. I'd love to hear from you when I, when I open this up for Q&A and we'll get going. So again, I'm Wes Moss. If, you, if you've got an alert, you, you likely have uh, seen my channel and hopefully that what, I've been, what we've been doing as a team has been helpful. Let me try to get maybe a little closer here out of the sunlight. Gosh, it's so bright here today. Um, there we go. I think that maybe is a little bit better. But there are just so many questions in this, just an absolute upside down world that we're living in. And we're worried about health, but we're also worried about economics and we're worried about our investments and the stock market, which has been the most volatile stock market really in a century. We saw the fastest decline in the S&P 500 we've ever seen down to 35%. And we've, we've, we've actually seen the biggest, quickest rally in the stock market that we've ever seen. And again, in going back 100 years, we've seen the biggest rally in the, in the market that we have ever seen. So it's just a confusing time for investors, and I get that. And I'm going to go through a couple of these questions I've just recently gotten, and I think that these may be helpful. Uh, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. All right. Hey, Wes, I'm age 65 and recently retired. Uh, e even my well-diversified portfolio, see if you can relate to this, even my well-diversified portfolio has taken a hit during the COVID-19 market crash. This economy, uh, this market and economy feel worse than we've ever seen. Shouldn't I just sell out and keep my money in cash until we recover? And I, I, listen, I, I think that, that it, see, if you're human, you've thought of that. If you have money in the market and you're an investor, if you're a human being, you've thought that, you've thought that, wait a minute, why don't I just get out? Because there's so much uncertainty. And I think this really is the worst it's seen. You know, we, we go back, when you, we, you, when you hear about market history, you hear, well, we made it through 9-11, we, we made it through World War II, we made it through assassinations and all these other things that we made it through 9-11, which, which was just such a scary time as we remember back to 9-11. But this is, it, it's different and it, economically there is a, kind of a new set of circumstances that we've, we've just never seen. You know, we're going to see this economy down 30% in GDP in the second quarter. And by the way, and this is maybe just a public service note because I'm such a huge advocate for the reopening plan uh, that that's, that needs to start being rolled out. The difference, is, and let me just leave our audience, I'll start with this. The difference between, we know we're going to be down about 30% for, for, um, for, for GDP. So gross domestic product in the United States will be down 30%. And I just got a question here. We survived the Great Depression 
20th century, the 1918 Spanish flu. Yes, we did. We also didn't have social media, and we didn't have the, the main. We didn't have the media. You know, we didn't have 24-hour news cycle to scare people, maybe heighten the fear that we're living through right now. And we also did not shut down the economy in any of those scenarios. Uh, in fact, GDP during World War II went up. We didn't have negative GDP, believe it or not, in World War II because companies immediately went from making, let's say, cars or engines to making weapons. And the economy actually got going to, in World War II. It actually brought us out of a difficult economy. This, in so many different ways, is the opposite of that. And it's a worse economy, at least for this small period of time than we've ever seen. But the difference between, and this is through some recent economic modeling that I've done this week, we're going to be down, let's call it 30% gross domestic product in Q2, quarter two, which is April, May, June. The difference between down 30% and down 60% is the difference between reopen, leaving things shut down just like we are today all through the month of May and getting May to be at least somewhat restarted, meaning that we start the restart in May and we get back to 90%, 95% of economic activity. Doesn't mean 100%, but it means we restart some of the areas that are totally shut down. If we don't do that during May, at all, we wait till June and we have a, a, a really, really slow June and we don't really get going until July, then we won't see just a 30% decline in GDP. We'll see a 60% decline in GDP. So that is something that I think that is a really important piece of the equation. And I, and I, it's funny on these channels, it's funny, I see these, these questions, but they don't last very long. So if you wanna, it, it, I know I just saw another question. If you can maybe just repost that and I'll read it. Because I actually, I'd, I'd rather this be a live q and I've got lots of questions here that I'm going to go into. So whoever just posted that last question, if you can just repost it and I'll read it immediately. And I will go ahead and answer that question. So, um, and I think it had something to do with, with, with this market here. Um, I'm, I'm kind of just waiting for that same question, if you can put it back up. Otherwise, here's I think what a lot of people are asking. Hey, do I just sell out and go to cash and wait till this thing's over? Uh, here we go. If you knew the market was going to, to fall 30%, what would you have done? Advisors always say, stay the course, market timing, slot. Love, great. Such an important question right now is that the, the prevailing thought is stay the course, stay the course, stay the course. This too shall pass, this too shall pass. And I am a very, very optimistic in American uh, perseverance and our ability to work any problem and get through it. So I'm a big believer that things continue, will get better. But the question kind of goes back to, first of all, if you knew this was coming and you, then there's really no scenario in the world where you know about every single hiccup or big hiccup or, or car crash like we're in now happening. There, there's really no scenario that that happens. So what you need to do, and this has been proven, there's no hedge fund out there. There's no computer algorithm out there that's been able to hop in the market when the market's at a low and then get out of the market right before every crisis. It just doesn't happen. There, there, is, there's, there is no wizardry about being able to do that. Now you can be very, make very educate, educated uh, assumptions and educated decisions on where we are in these cycles, but there's never been anyone proven in the history of, of markets to be able to step in and out and completely dance between the raindrops uh, uh, over and over and over again. Just, just, just not, it's not reality. So what we have to be able to do when it comes to, if we know we can't fully market time, and this goes back to the question I just got and this question I was gonna start out with, which is, shouldn't we just get out and wait until things get better? And the answer is, that is market timing. So. If you know bad things are gonna happen, which we do, we can only control what we can control. What does that mean? Well, it means that we've gotta have a portion and maybe a significant portion. Here's the answer to, I think, both of these questions. You gotta have, we have to have three things. We have to always have in our investments a portion uh, and that is our, our essentially our dry powder that allows us to get through these difficult periods of time that we know are always coming. We know we're gonna have a year or two years when markets are bad. We know that. 
Uh, so what do we do? Well, we take a portion of our investment portfolio, our retirement portfolio, and we make sure that it's in highly stable areas of whether that would be cash or bonds. And instead of thinking of it as a percentage basis, and a lot of investors think, well, I've got 30% in stocks and 40% in bonds and this percent in cash. I would challenge you to do this. I think this is this has really helped our clients get through this, what was a very difficult March and a much, at least there are a lot of repair that has been done so far in April. But what really helped our families, and we have a relatively conservative client base. Most of our clients are retired. They're in their 60s and up typically. So they're either right before retirement or they're getting, they're already in retirement or they've been in retirement. Rather than thinking, oh, I have a percentage, it's 20% or 30% or 40% in safety assets. Think of that in terms of years of dry powder versus percentage. All right, what do I mean by that? I mean, if I need $2,000 a month, and from my portfolio, and I know I have to take it no matter what. That means $24,000 a year. Well, if I have a, a $500,000 portfolio, that means rather than saying I have 50% in dry powder or cash or bonds that should not go down materially during one of these massive market cycles, then to me, psychologically, I can say to myself, all right, if I've got 50% of my portfolio, which on a $500,000 portfolio would be about $250,000, which by the way, if I need $24,000 a year from my portfolio, that's a decade. That's 10 years worth of dry powder that I'm not worried about going up and down because it's my, those are my safety assets. So think about that shift. I've got 50% in stocks and 50% in bonds, but the whole thing moves up. Well, wait a minute. No, no, no. You have 50% in stocks, but I have... 10 years worth of dry powder that I can use for spending to get me through these terrible periods of time when the stock market is behaving uh, terribly, volatile, going down, whatever you wanna call it, bear markets like we saw. We, we were down 35% with the Dow Jones in a very compact period of time. Now we've rallied, by the way, back over 25%. So the market is down now, call it in the, in the mid-teens for the year, depending on if you look at the S&P 500 or the Dow. But think about that psychological shift. It's worked really well through this crisis for, I think a lot of investors is reframing how the assets are positioned. So you've got your, whether it's 100,000 or 500,000 or a million or $5 million, you're thinking about the safety side of the equation in terms of time, in terms of years versus in percentages. And I think that's the first step here. And I think that ho hopefully answers that first question I got through the, for, for this live event here, was what would you have done knowing the market go, was, is about to go down? Well, we always know that the market has the, the, the potential to, to go down just like this. Bear markets happen all the time. You know, we've had, on average, you get 10% correction. The average, average year for the U.S. stock market is debt, has a 13% correction, just on average every single year, almost 14%. And then we get these bear markets anywhere from every three to five years. So we know these are going to happen. So it all have to, has to do with the upfront planning, uh, knowing that we're going to go through these periods of time. And how can you feel comfortable? And I think my, my plan here is thinking about your safe assets, assets in terms of time versus percentage. So that's dry powder dry. When I say dry powder, I mean safety assets. Now, by the way, there's been a huge help by the U.S. Federal Reserve to make sure our dry powder is dry. Meaning that the Fed, back on March 23rd, said, we want to make sure that safety assets are safe. I want to make sure, we, the Fed said, we will do unlimited backstopping of the very assets that go into money markets. So money markets are made up of really short-term, high, highly safe debt instruments. Think Think of something like a short-term treasury or commercial paper that's meant to be AAA rated in short term. Well, the, the, there was a period of time where even safety assets were going down during the, 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 the earlier days of March. And the Federal Reserve came in and said, look, we're, we're the buyer of last resort. We have the firepower and the capacity to do it. And it really shored up the credit markets, which really means now, what does that mean for you? It means safe assets are now in a much safer position than they have been in, call it, decades. So I think it's a really important piece of the equation. The next part is, is quality and income. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, think about this, think about this for a minute. In this post-COVID economy, we're in a, in a shutdown today, 
And then we are, we know that when we reopen, there's still going to be lots of areas of the economy that are in terrible shape. Think about the, the massive difference between a company that is rely, that is a restaurant company or a cruise company, cruise lines, right? Think about one of the big cruise operators or an airline versus, or a retailer, some of the, a company that is a bunch of retail centers that they're, they're, rent, they're depending on stores to pay rent for people to come in and buy their product versus, versus a company that let's say is a healthcare company or a video technology company. Think about the difference between those two economic outcomes. And, and when I say quality, I, I will say that what gets me through this period of time from the stock side of the equation is, are companies that have huge amount of cash on their balance sheets that don't have to, that can take a month or two or three months of a terrible, terrible revenue and still be fine and still thrive. Not all publicly traded companies can do that. There are several dozen, let's call it, there are 50 to 100 really solid companies in the S&P 500. And then out of the 3,500 listed stocks in the United States, there are a ton of companies that are already very marginal and those are the riskier places to be. So you go through these tough periods of time, you really have to own and make sure you're understanding high quality companies relative to just any company across the board. Okay, now let's go to, and then the, my third part here, uh, and that the, my screen just got darker. I don't know if it got darker for you guys, but uh, let's go back to this. Beam, let's try that. Here we go. Maybe that's better, I don't know. No, I'm not trying to stop my streaming. Okay, anyway, oh, we're good, okay. Um, thanks, Mallory. And then recovery, here's the other thing. We, you gotta remember that, that we are going to have a recovery. And I've had some of my best friends reach out and say, Wes, you know, and these are, these are folks in their 40s that are saying, gosh, shouldn't I be selling out of my 401k today and then wait for this over and then I'm gonna get back in. And, and my thought is to say, well, what if you get out today and the market rallies 10 or 15%. Just like what happened from March 23rd, three weeks later, actually 15 trading days later, markets were up uh, th almost 30% in, in the blink of an eye, that quickly. And you keep, you, you've heard, if you study history and you hear advisors say, well, this too shall pass, don't miss. It's not about timing the market, it's about time in the market. The last couple of months have been a perfect example of that. If you got out on March 23rd, when things were at their darkest hour with the stock market, you missed an almost 30%, 30% run up in stock. So in order to be a successful stock investor, you have to be there. And, and by the way, who would have known that that day, March 23rd, would have been the day that everything turned? The Federal Reserve came in and said, we're gonna backstop credit. The, the, the credit market, the bond market actually started to go back up, but the stock market had another terrible day. It wasn't until the next day, uh, seemingly on no more good news, that the market rallied. And then it continued to rally, even though we had 3 million job losses, then 6 million job losses, and we just had another 5 million. We're at 22 million jobless claims since this has started, yet the market's rallied 30%. So it's a really good example in real time that you can't time this perfectly because it happens so quickly. You've got to just be there. And again, my point is quality companies that pay dividends. And by the way, we heard from Johnson & Johnson this week. Johnson & Johnson, and again, obviously I'm not saying rush out and buy any of these companies. So I always have to say that as a disclaimer. But as an example, Johnson & Johnson that was started in the 1800s, just did over $20 billion in revenue for the last quarter and still had a tremendous amount of profit and increased their dividend, by the way, by over 6%, which they've done now almost 60 straight years. So you're looking at these companies, you say, well, things are gonna be so bad. No, 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 wait a minute. In a year from now, are you telling me this economy isn't getting, isn't a whole lot better and can, let's call it 100% better than where it is today or dramatically better than where we are today? So we've just got to, to, to take ourselves out of the dark, the moment, this momentary darkness for a terrible April and a really rough May economically and look to six months from now 
or eight months from now, when by the way, we'll probably, we were not gonna have a vaccine until let's call it next year, but we might very well have a great therapeutic or an antibody that helps the folks that are getting sick uh, be able to get well quicker at a much higher rate. And we have now a, a, a better understanding from a public health perspective, we're gonna be able to reopen this economy and, and we're not gonna have to wait until January. So I think that it's important just to remember that we are going to be able to reopen and as investors, we've got to be there for that recovery. <clears throat> now, let's do this because I've got, now we're live here. Let's go ahead and just take your live questions for a second here. Uh, and, and Mallory, I don't know if you can tell me how to get rid of this, what looks like uh, this, these, this enhanced, the screen to change the picture. <laughs> Hold on here, there we go. Uh, go ahead and, and go ahead and an ask questions, and we'll do this as a live Q and A. Here we go. The market, uh, but the market up thirteen. This comes from James, but the market up thirteen percent was still far below when it came down. Yeah, yeah. And keep keep the questions coming. By the way, well, again, how many days does the market stay at an all time high? Markets are only at an all time high for literally for moments, and because we're off by markets, don't just continue to, it's not, an, it's not an escalator higher forever. Markets are always going to have this period of volatility. So we can't expect markets to stay where they are all the time. And that's why I think it's important, particularly for younger investors in your 30s and your 40s and your 50s, when you're well before retirement, to continually invest because markets don't ever stay at high. All right. Our Monte Carlo analysis gives us a 90% probability of success in three months. Why don't these questions stay longer? In your opinion, what are the chances that we'll be retesting the lows, if not, okay, or if not significantly below the mark? Okay, great question. What are the chances that we are going to retest the lows of the stock market that we're in March, that we're way above today? One of the, a very important question. I think it depends on the virus. And, and, and thank you. Hang on to that, that, that Monte Carlo question here. I'll get to that in a second. What are the chances that we retest those lows? The, I, I think it has everything to do with the virus itself and the reopening of the economy. If we continue to see progress in the virus, like we are seeing, and again, we, it's, if you look at New York City, they've already peaked and are coming down. If you look at Italy and Germany and Spain, all of those, those countries are, are a full 10 to 14 days ahead of us. All of those countries have peaked now many days ago and have, are continuing to come down on the, with the virus and the, and the number of new cases. If that continues here, and we can now are continue to see uh, virus new cases continue to come down, and that continues, then there's a high probability that we actually do see some reopening of this economy in the month of May. Here in the state of Georgia, we're a little behind where New York is. The governor says we're allowed to e reopen on the 13th of May. I think what we'll see, and, and I think what we'll do at our company and, we'll, and a lot, what a lot of companies will do is say, well, wait a minute, A, working from home works. We've done everybody from home. We, and we've had 100% of our employees working out of the house and that worked well. So now let's say maybe 50% of people go back. So we maintain social distancing and we do all the things that we now know to do. We wear masks, we wash our hands, we do hand sanitizer, we don't touch our faces. And we have now a month from now, call it mid-May, we have companies like Abbott who just came out with their fourth, by the way, test for this. And there, which is a serological test to tell you if you had the disease or if you had the virus and you've recovered, by the way, which is massively important, to the tune of millions and millions of tests that they'll be able to do per week. And if we can do that in combination, that's still a month away. I'm still saying we do social distancing for a whole other month from where we are today. Then I'm of the belief that the vi we, not only does the virus keep getting lower and lower and lower, the economy starts back up and up and up. We start the restart in May. And if that plays out, I think that we have seen the lows. I do. Now, again, I, we, nobody knows has a perfect crystal ball. If for some reason we mess up the restart and the virus starts to massively spike back up, and we have we have diminished hospital capacity, then we do, I think we do retest the lows. So that's why I watch the virus numbers every single day to see the trends. If they continue to go in the right direction, I think that, and we are able to re get the restart started, 
Let's start the restart. Maybe if we're gonna do hashtag start the restart in May, then I don't think we have to retest those lows at all. All right, now, uh, because I get to only see these questions for, for two, uh, maybe if I hit the question, the, no. I don't see that. That doesn't work either. So, so again, uh, let me, I'll, I'll read the question as soon as you put it up. And if you've already put up a question, just put up. Our Monte Carlo analysis uh, gives us 90% probability of success. Your advisor says you're still on track because the tool takes market drops like this into account. Do you agree? Oh, absolutely. You know, we, we, again, remember, bear markets happen throughout the course of history all the time. We had a 50, almost a 50% market drop after 9-11. We had a, during that recession that included 9-11. We had a uh, over 50% market drop during the great financial crisis. And by the way, uh, you, you're welcome, evolutionary Tom. Uh, you're welcome. The, um, the, we had an over 50% S&P 500 decline during the great financial crisis. Uh, that's two massive, and then we had a 20% market correction at the end of 2018. The Monte Carlo analysis takes all of the, the, the bear markets and recessions that we've had for 100 years into account. So it's not as though the, the Monte Carlo basically for those watching is just saying, uh, what are the probabilities if you retire today, if the market has similar peaks and valleys and peaks and valleys like it has over the past 100 years, it reruns your retirement portfolio starting, basically starting on a new day every single day with, with thousands and thousands of iterations to say, well, in 80, 90, 95% of, of cases, no matter what day you retired, you were in, your portfolio still gave you enough income to retire without running out. And that's what we're trying to do. That's what you need to do with retirement planning is, is give yourself a 90 plus percent probability that money doesn't run out. All right, let me keep going here. After the 20% the drop on Christmas. Okay, sorry, Ted, I didn't get the first part of that. So I think like Ted, it looks like Ted had a question about the 20% drop. Again, I'll read these questions very quickly as soon as they get posted because and now we're getting more and more people on, on live here. Welcome. By the way, Wes Moss here, answer your question. Sean, we're, dollar cost averaging is still a valid investment strategy. Can you speak to good portfolio ratio stock versus by the current environment? Yes. Okay. Testing my reading ability here. The dollar cost averaging works, it works, it works. And it is because we don't know when we get these peaks and valleys and they happen so quickly, no one is ever, ever able to time them perfectly. So the, the strategy to the, optimize your investment portfolio over time is just to continue to, to systematically add, to add every, every two weeks in your 401k and you add once a month or once or once every couple of weeks to an investment portfolio. And that is the best defense against all these market uh, peaks and valleys. The next part says, well, how much should I, what's a, what is the ultimate investment portfolio ratio, stocks versus bonds? I can tell you for retirees to not run out of money and still keep up with inflation. And I've done, I redid the 4% rule study back in uh, about a year and a half ago that was a really famous study in our industry from William Bangin, who did it in the 19, he published it in 1991. I redid his whole study in 2017-18, and the 4% rule still works, but here's one of the, 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 the big takeaway on the stock side, and that, that takeaway is that you wanna maintain 50 to 70% of your portfolio in equities. And here, what's, here this is interesting. If you, do, if you go beyond that, and you go, let's say you're over 70% in stocks, what can happen, doesn't always happen, but what can happen is that your timing in retirement, you retire at a really bad time. And if you're too heavily loaded in stocks, the big corrections can permanently damage the portfolio and you have to really materially decrease your income. If you're, too, if you're way less than 50% in equities over time, then you run the risk of not being able to keep up with inflation. So it's, there really is this optimal zone, particularly for folks that are going into this, call it 20, 30, 40 year retirement, is the 50% equities to 70% equities in order to take 4% of your starting value plus inflation, ratcheting up every year for whatever inflation is uh, over time to, to give yourself an 85 percent chance of not running out of money. And that's if you do it linearly. The great thing about retirement planning and that 4% rule is that you're, 
that's not how we spend a retirement. We don't say, well, I took out 40 grand my first year and inflation went up 10%. I'm going to take out 44 grand for the, for forever until it ratchets up again. And I'm going to do that systematically. No, that's not how we do it. We have, let's say you retire at a, at a fortunate time and you, you've got enough money to retire and it's March of 2009. Well, you've had an amazing run for 10 years and you're way beyond your expectations. So you've been able to ratchet up your spending. Well, if you retired in March of 2000, and then we went through really the worst 10 years in the market we've seen in almost history, then guess what? Those folks probably had to reduce their spending at some point, or maybe even go back to work for a year or two or three to try to pad the retirement portfolio. So in real life, Retirement spending is dynamic. The 4% the rule that I think is such a critical piece of understanding if you're in retirement or as you're doing your planning for retirement is, is a really amazingly strong and good guide, but it is not to the letter and it's not static. It is it, You have to look at it as a guide and then dynamically be either maybe increase your spending if things are going really well and then maybe be ready to or prepared to decrease your spending when we're going through difficult periods of time. Okay, maybe let's just do maybe one more question here as we do this. This is my first YouTube live. I used to do Facebook live back in the day. Um, if you tuned in again, I'm Wes Moss just here in my makeshift home office like everybody else. I've got this little tripod thing that I'm not using because I'm just putting the, the this up against the wall. And I don't know why. Here we go. Now is, it, is now a good time to rebalance a portfolio to match your target? Yeah. The answer is yes. There, there's a uh, Rebalancing, and depending on how you talk to you about this, but statistically, it's one of the it's one of the few free lunches if you actually do it in retirement or a, as an investor. Meaning that it, rebalancing statistically, or, or rebalancing if you do it systematically, do it over and over again. Let's say every year or twice a year. What you ultimately are doing for yourself is forcing yourself to sell the assets that have actually done the best and buy the assets that have done the worst. And there's this wonderful mathematical uh, circumstance that happens in investing, it's called reversion of the mean. So typically what has done the best ends up doing a little bit worse over time. So if you're always rebalancing, you're, you're, you're forcing yourself to buy what has not done well and sell what has done the best and, and giving yourself a automatic buy high, sell low, or I'm sorry, buy low, sell high strategy that it works over time. So. I think it's a really good question. So absolutely rebalancing works. And let's just do, let's see, one more question here. Thanks so much. You're welcome, Sean. Thank you for joining the first YouTube live that I think we, that, that we've ever done. Uh, what else here? Uh, let's see here. And again, I'll try to read these as quickly as I can. So just post your question and I'll get to it. I have to read it really, really quickly. Well, here we go. Uh, do you see restaurants, sporting events, theaters, concerts coming back anytime soon? Yeah, I think this is a really important one. This has to do, I just saw something about the uh, California saying no more sporting events on all of 2020. And that may be the case, but here's what is, uh, this, this goes back to this bifurcation of industries that are going to win or lose after this. And I think that what you're going to see, and we just saw from the PGA that they're going to do a Charles Schwab uh, event. I think it's the Charles Schwab Open or something like that in, in Texas in June. Uh, no spectators, but they're going to actually have it on TV. And I think that to some extent, I don't know why we wouldn't already be doing that. Is that I know that I guess basketball players, you know, basketball is one of the first to go. And I guess you're, that we're worried about even basketball players themselves being in contact. But the reality here is that I think we got very scared, arguably correctly, in the beginning of this because of, of the impending unknown. And now as we learn more about COVID-19, maybe we start to say, wait a minute, okay, let's just not cancel the entire season and play no games. There's still mil hundreds of millions of people that want to watch basketball or want to watch golf or want to watch a live sporting event. So isn't it okay to have four golfers in a foursome socially distanced? We can still play the golf tournament. Let's broadcast it to millions of people and now we can have live sports. So I, we may not, this we may not be. You know, live events, I think, are the very last thing to come back. 
because you've got to figure out a way to test people walking into a stadium and how do you control 15, 20, 30, 50,000 people, 80,000 people in college football, 100,000 people in the How do you control for that? I think that's still a challenge in 2020. But it doesn't mean that the teams can't play. It doesn't mean that we can't broadcast those games. I think that's a really important way to start thinking about this rationally. I mean, like the governor of, of Michigan, which uh, is, and, and there's protests about this, and arguably so, you're not even allowed to leave your house to drive to a, a remote, your, your vacation house in the state of Michigan, even if you live on a remote lake. What? That just doesn't make any sense. So we've overcorrected in this economy in a lot of ways. Uh, uh, sports is a really good example of that. We just canceled the whole NBA, uh, NCAA tournament. Uh, no more NBA games. No golf. The Masters. Totally canceled. Now, I think we're getting a, a little bit of a happy meeting and say, wait a minute. We, we, we can, people can play golf. So let's get back to golf and we'll televise it. As far as bars and restaurants, I think that they, I think that if you, do, we, are, we are smarter today than we were about public health uh, by a factor of 10 times better and smarter about it than we were two months ago. So if we are now doing all the things that we need to do from a public health perspective, why wouldn't we be able to reopen restaurants in some capacity? Why wouldn't we be able to, maybe we take 50 tables and we take them down to 25 so we're socially distanced. Now, the, the, I, I know that at Starbucks, they're wearing the masks. So that we do these things like other countries, let's say Japan is a good example of everyone wearing a mask protects everybody else. But if only 20% of people wear, wear masks, it doesn't really help. So if we're smart about it, I don't see why we don't get back to opening up the restaurants. And then if testing is good as good as we need it, the serological tests work, so we know people that already had COVID uh, that are that are not going to get reinfected at least for another year or two because of we don't know how long the the uh, immune response or the antibodies last. But we do. There's lots of evidence that it lasts at least for a while. I don't know why we wouldn't be able to get the restaurants started to reopen even as early as May or some 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 areas uh, of the country in mid May and certainly by June. And I think that's the point here is that we've got to be rational about if we wait, if we wait till COVID-19 is totally gone to be able to do anything and reopen this economy, it's not going to be until the spring of 2021. And by that point, we will have gone so far into we will we will go so far beyond what the Great Depression was that you keep we, we heard in the beginning the cure is worse than the disease, that is an example. I mean, you get you get a negative 60% GDP for multiple quarters in a row, you'll have 50 to 100 million people out of work in America. You, you will have social, you, you will have social discourse in America. So I don't think, I think, and I think Americans are smart enough, I know Americans are smart enough, that we don't just sit there and watch a house burn. We don't do that. In America, we, we look, we, we say, wait a minute, let's put out the fire. We're not going to watch, we're not going to sit by, sit on our hands and watch the economy burn to the ground. We're not going to do that. Uh, we're in the, in the early stages, we are sitting there watching, waiting, doing nothing. But Americans are smart enough to figure out that we have to get restarted in some capacity. And that's going to start happening, I, I believe, very, I, I believe very strongly and will continue to advocate for getting, and I know it's a tightrope. But we, we need to start the restart in the month of May. It may not be May 1st, but certainly by mid-May, I, I can very much see realistically business owners saying, hey guys, let's, let's get at least 50% back people in the office. Let's get this restarted, maybe not overnight, but let's get the process going that allows restaurants to start opening. I think about our building. Well, how's the restaurant in our building at the ground floor going to be able to make a living if no one is in the building? And a lot of retail is like that. It's called mixed use. It's, 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 a, it's a typical model of America. Uh, you've got rent to companies. Then you've got a restaurant downstairs, maybe a little bit of retail. If everyone's home from work, then how do the retailers or the restaurants even have any customers? So you've got to get commerce back. We just have to do it in a smart way, which all the things I talk about that are public health oriented, and then of course testing oriented, and then we can get piece of this piece of these this economy back online, and we don't have to see a negative sixty GDP print. 
We don't have, we're going to probably see 20 million people unemployed anyway. We don't need to see, or 20% unemployment. We don't need to see 30 or 40% unemployment. And it's going to be up to us. It's going to be up to Americans to restart this economy so that we can all get through this together. And, and with that, listen, our team, if you have questions about the CARES Act, which is the $2.2 trillion stimulus or the PPP loans, the Paycheck Protection Loans, our team has put together a Q&A that, are, that is a tremendous resource for folks on, at, right on the website at westmoss.com under the tools tab. There is a tab that has as many questions and answers as, as we've gotten that we thought would be really helpful, and they're all aggregated in that one area. So you can go to the, the tools tab on westmoss.com, W-E-S-M-O-S.com, and then search for your question, anything about CARES back, whether it's unemployment, the enhanced unemployment, the PPP loans, the economic disaster loans, the um, uh, all of the different pieces of the equation on the CARES Act. Now... Uh, remember too, we're, listen, we're, all, we're still open for business. And I don't know even ge- geographically know where we have our viewers on today, but uh, we're open for business at, at our, our firm. And a lot of, like a lot of America, 75% of America is still open. And that is the key here. We're, we are still open. And it, wait, SSI question I've asked before, above is yes, sir. The answer, I didn't see the full question. The answer is yes. If you have SSI, which is supplement, hi from Singapore, hey, from Atlanta, uh, SSI or, or Social Security or supplemental Social Security, you still get a stimulus check, by the way. You still get a stimulus check. I just read that uh, or this week. So the answer is yes. But wherever you're from, whether it is Singapore or Texas or Seattle, uh, and you are looking for investment help, financial planning help, guess what? We are open for business. We have a whole team of 40 folks that are working virtually that are doing Zoom meetings and FaceTime and phone calls. And we're, we're open for business, happy to help. We have a whole team of certified financial planners and uh, folks uh, to, to help you. So if you're in a position that you say, look, I need some help with the dry powder, with the high quality companies, with the, with the companies that pay income, Hey, hey, we're part of the economy that is open and we're, I'm advocating for more people to reopen because we're in this collectively from a health perspective and an economic perspective together. So if you need help or know somebody that needs some help, uh, we've been doing this for 25 plus years. You know where to find us. Go to westmoss.com. There's a contact button in the upper right hand corner. You can contact us. We'll get back to you within probably a, several, a few hours because we're all tied to our, our, our computers. And if you have friends that need help, send up, send them the links as well. Just send them westmoss.com and our team, any questions, we'll get back to you. Uh, we're here to absolutely help. So yes, Eric Kirk, is that yes? The answer is, I didn't see the question, but I think the question was, is SSI, do you get a stimulus check? The answer is yes. Um, now with that, thank you for being here. We're in this together. We'll get through it together. Everyone stay healthy and be well.